Okay, so we have essentially, I'll do a little drawing up here, the same thing. We have a mass spring damper system that's undergoing a forcing function. We know that M is 10 kilograms, C is 45 newton seconds per meter, and K is 2,500 newtons per meter. And f of t, our forcing function, it says it quite clearly that it's a, um, a harmonic force, so it's an oscillation, a sinusoid, of amplitude 180 newtons and frequency of 3.5 hertz. <coughs> so it's 180 is the amplitude, it's an oscillation, cosine of 3.5 hertz, so that's 2 pi times by 3.5, because this is obviously this is an equation radians per second, times by t. There's our forcing function. So 2 pi times 3.5, we can obviously work it out, that's 7 pi which equals, if you write that out, 21.5 newtons per second. And that equals 10 meg. So that's the forcing function. Okay. Remember, there is no subscript on this omega. It's not omega naught, it's not omega d. It is the frequency that is being given to the system by the forcing function. Okay? So there's our system, there's our forcing function, and there's the frequency of which the force is being applied. The magnitude is 180, and omega, the, the forcing function frequency, is 21.9912 radians per second. <coughs> that relates to a frequency of 3.5 hertz. Now we know that the solution for this sort of function, we found it in the notes, we derived it last week, is A cosine of omega t minus delta. And we found out what A was in the notes. The alternative form for A quite clearly is A equals F naught upon K times by 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus R squared squared plus 2 zeta R squared all square rooted. That's in your notes. And delta is the inverse tangent of 2 zeta r divided by 1 minus r squared. Remember, with a force system, the amplitude and the phase are not adjustable. They do not depend on initial conditions. They are defined purely by the system and the force being applied.
<coughs> so let's work out what these various things are. We know F0, F0 is 180. <coughs> We've got K. We need to find R. Now R is omega upon omega naught. That's so what's omega naught? Well, omega naught is K upon M square rooted. Root K upon M. So that's root 2500 divided by 10. If you do the sums, that's 15. Point eight one one eight one one Now, knowing these bits of information, this and that frequency up there, what can you say about the phase of the system? The driving frequency is above the natural frequency, so is it going to? Is the? Uh, is it going to be in? In? It's going to be out of phase. It's going to start to be opposite um, to that. So you get a minus phase function. Obviously, the equation's got a minus in there, so that will end up being positive in the solution. But yes, you're going to be out of phase. We're going to be uh, certainly heading towards um, being 180 degrees out of phase. With omega naught, omega, sorry, r is therefore omega divided by omega naught. So that's going to be 21.9912 divided by 15.8114. To do those sums, you get 1.39. Zero eight. So we've got F naught, we've got K, we've got R. We now need to find zeta, and it's the same same things you need to find for the for the delta term up there. And so zeta is C divided by two root M K. So that's 45 divided by 2, square root of m, which is 10, and k, which is 2,500. So now we've got all the terms to stick into that equation for A and that equation for delta. So let's go and find them. So A is 180 divided by 2500. 1 is the square root of 1 minus R 1.3. 908 squared, all squared, plus 2 times by zeta, 0 0.1423 times by r, 1.3908 squared, all square rooted.
Now, if you did this in your calculator, your calculator will give you 70.95 times 10 to the minus 3 meters, or 0 0.07095 meters. <coughs> Similarly, delta is the inverse tangent of 2 zeta r over 1 minus r squared. So that's the inverse tangent of 2, 0 0.1423, 1 1.3908 divided by 1 minus 1.3 squared. With those sums, you get minus 0 0.4007 radians. Make sure that when you're doing these trig functions and stuff, make sure your calculator is programmed to give you an answer in radians. Okay? Because the only way that that solution works if it's in degrees is if you make sure that you've written the degree symbol up in the corner, you know, with this... Uh, with the function up here, <coughs> this one up here, it's fine to put that in degrees as long as you've written that in degrees, okay? Because otherwise it's assumed you're in radians. So there's our value for A, there's our value for delta. <coughs> 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 So we simply plug in our value for A and our value for delta into our equation, which is this equation here, to get our solution of facts of T. Now the question wasn't designed to trick you, but it gives you some superfluous information. Could anybody tell me what that superfluous information was? Read the question. It says if the initial displacement and velocity of the mass are 15 millimeters and 5 meters per second, find the complete solution representing the motion of the mass as time goes to infinity. Well, that bit, as time goes to infinity, okay, is this solution here. It doesn't care what's happening initially. So the initial conditions are completely disregarded in the solution to this equation. This is the what's known as a steady state solution. When we're talking about steady state, we're thinking, okay, well, let's get rid of the transients, let's forget about that. What happens after the initial conditions? As time increases, what's the solution going to look like? Well, it's going to look like this. Okay, it's not going to have anything to do with what happens initially. Like I said, next week when we cover chapter 3, we start on chapter 3, you'll see that there will be an element of what happens initially in the solution. But as time goes to infinity, the steady state solution, which is important for you to realize, is the stuff that has nothing to do with initial conditions. It's this stuff, okay? And you'll come across that again and again and again. What is the steady state solution of the response, okay? Well, if that's the case, 
and it's not a free oscillation, it's a, um, it's a forced oscillation, then you don't need to worry about what's happening to start with. The initial conditions, like I said, are irrelevant, because eventually it's going to follow this equation. There'll be some you know, fiddling around trans with transients at the start of it, okay? But eventually you'll end up running with this equation, okay?